Welcome to another episode of the Keep It All Change Cars podcast. My name is Gugu Masuku and I'm joined by two phenomenal people in studio. One of them has been in the motoring industry since before anyone in this room was actually born. Um, he, he, I mean, he started in 1970. That was a long time ago and he's been pushing since then. Um, he then moved on to joining the Imperial Group and basically is one of the pivotal people that made the group what it is today. And I'm talking about Ray Levine. If you haven't heard of him, Google him. Ray, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Google. Nice to be here. Well, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure. And uh, and to you too, Michael. Uh, thank you. An honor. Uh, I mean, it's an and, honor. Uh, I look forward to this, this, uh, this dialogue that we're going to have. Well, we look forward to gaining wisdom and uh, being the two youngest people. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. So I'm born in 1973. And yeah. as you said, Ray started when I wasn't even in diapers. When I was in diapers, he was already a veteran of the trade three years. We are going to learn so much today. We're going to learn a lot. Ray, uh, you're retired now from what I understand. Is that correct? correct? I was retired. <laughs> <laughs> you were retired. You're back now. Correct. You back. know the saying, I'm, com you I'm coming back with a bank. That's good. You know Boy. the saying, Gugu, you can't keep a good man down. And this of is course. the proverbial of that. Yeah. So now, Ray, I mean, you could write essentially two books in, on, on all that you've seen and done over the years. But I think where we want to get started is how, how did the true legend Ray Levine start? How did it all come about? How did you get into this? So I think uh, it started uh, in the early 70s. Um, uh, my parents owned a hotel uh, in Kensington. And uh, I used to work there as a chef and uh, it just wasn't for me. I think that uh, when I was in the army, unfortunately, I cooked for 3,000 people at <laughs> a time and that killed my desire. Yeah. Um, and what, were then, they not complimenting you on the food or what was it? Well, that's another story. But we can, uh, when you cook for 3,000 people and you just throw eggs into boiling water <laughs> and then pull them out, not very tasty after mm. an hour sitting in a, a bay marie. The army wasn't a precursor to MasterChef. That no, 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 you. No, 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 definitely not. But however, after that, I, I went and joined my parents in the hotel. My father was always interested in uh, the catering business and he bought a hotel. Um, unfortunately, where this hotel was positioned was a rough, a rough area. And uh, I eventually, I disliked it. I really took a disliking to, to that industry. And I went out and I became a car salesman. In Jewel Street? Uh, uh, no, not at all. You weren't far from Jewel Street? I wasn't far from Jewel Street, but uh, I went to a place called Talk Leyland. Talk Leyland used to sell many... Uh, Austin Apache, uh, Rover, I don't know if you remember them. Of course. And uh, Austin Marina, the worst car ever in the world. I can't and relate to any of it, I must be honest. You've heard uh, of the uh, Leyland product? No, not at all. So it's British? Uh-huh. So they used to call it British Leyland it was, at the time. It, it was. Huh? And the, uh, any product you we would have known is the Mini and the Jaguar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those were the two. Okay. I can still remember So this the was a group that was responsible for all these brands? Yeah, this was McCarthy's, actually. Oh, wow. If you're yeah. looking for an inferior quality car, yeah. look no further than no. a Mini or Jaguar <laughs> at the time. And that's uh, the honest truth. Yeah, but you, you're so right, Mark. I used to carry extra switches in my pocket. <laughs> really? Because either the floor switch didn't work or the, the electric window didn't work. I used to pull it out and just put a new one in, that type of thing. So it was good fun in those mm. days. Uh, and I left out one other called a Triumph. You right. must have heard it out there. Yes, That's for the sure. Yeah. So, so the Triumph brand today, Ray, again, when we, when you talk about Triumph, you talk about Triumph cars. Yeah. When you think of Triumph today. It's motorcycles. You, absolutely. Mm. And what kind of motorcycles? The best very, of the best. Very, classic motorcycles, but high-end, like quality motorcycles. Um, so, so Triumph came from being a, a, a car company Correct. and became a bike company. And Good I friend. drive one of them today. Really? I ride one of them today. Oh, you ride? Oh, which one do you have? The Bonneville. The Bonneville. Yes. The classic Bonneville. Yeah? Yeah. While you guys are talking bikes, I'm just <laughs> going to listen and learn. <laughs> yeah. No, so the, the, I, I had a Harley. Yeah. Um, but it got a little bit too heavy for me. Which one was it? I had, I've had two. I've oh. had the uh, uh, Road King mm -hmm. and I've had the, uh, um, come back to it, the smaller one. And they brought out the new motor, the 107. And uh, that's when I changed bikes. 
It was fantastic. Uh, it's a great bike. I miss yeah, yeah. it dearly. Uh, but now I've got my uh, Triumph. We'll go for a ride one day, right? I ride bikes, you ride bikes. Yeah. We'll... But you probably got a super bike. No, no, no. Uh, you know what, right? The funny thing is I may be young and that's that's the perceived um, stereotype with young people like myself. But I recently got a taste of adventure riding and I'm sold, completely sold. Adventure bikes, off-roading and that sort of stuff. That's what I really want to do now. <laughs> but it's interesting, and I mean, not digressing, but yes. if ever you're going to find a safety conscious rider, exactly what you said, you know, perception, super bike, you are, what, what, is the, what is the words of wisdom for our audience about riding a bike? Uh, don't do 300 k's an hour on the road. No, don't do that. L live through, so what I tell myself and what's, what's really got me to like be the person that I am is I always remind myself, live to ride another day. So whenever something stupid crosses your mind, just live to ride another day. Don't do it. Just you know, one hundred percent because our roads are shock. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the words didn't come out right. So, you uh, wanted to say S H I T. That's what you wanted to say. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> um, and then uh, after that uh, talk, Leyland, I uh, doubled with uh, one or two companies uh, that you won't even know that existed. Um, and then I uh, went and joined Toyota. And that's where I learned to really learn the craft of how to sell cars, new and used cars. I had a boss that was so anal that the tires had to face the right way of the bricks. Yeah. And just to aggravate him every morning as a colleague of mine and I, we would turn the wheels the other way <laughs> and it'd come in fl flaming red. But, you know, if you, if you uh, want a good business, there has to be a certain way to do it. Mm. And if you're consistent and you do it the same way every day, things will change for you. So I feel like you two both had a very similar start um, in the in the motor trade. It's funny enough, absolutely. Because I know your story. It's very similar to what Ray said. For, for sure. Yeah. But interesting that you spoke about Toyota. So it was Toyota by choice because in the 70s in South Africa, Toyota was identifiably, along with Mercedes, the standout brand. I mean, there was nothing compared to Toyota. So I'm going back into the 70s and uh, Brunt Pretorius used to be my uh, BDM. That's how long ago I'm talking about. And uh, we had a, a dealership in Morningside called uh, Dan Perkins. Um, so yeah, that's where we, I started uh, selling Toyotas. But Ray, you got a real claim to fame. Need advice? Visit changecars.co.za and click on the Keep It or Change Cars tab. If you've done Toyota, like you say, but there's one particular brand that you're known for and you were essentially responsible for bringing it into the country, correct? Yes, luckily. The brand. I think uh, I had luck or some guardian angel looking after me. And uh, I managed to obtain the care distribution for, for South Africa for, or, and Namibia and uh, Zimbabwe. Wow. But Ray, right there, you say guardian angel. It's a vision. Kia? an international brand, South Korea, well-known today. When you speak about Kia today, absolutely identifiable market leader, right up there with the best. In the mid-1990s in South Africa, I can tell you, I guarantee you, you had not heard of Kia. Had you heard of Kia before it came to South Africa? No. So there was, there's a few names I can give you for Kia. The first one is it was uh, King in Africa. The second one was it was cuck in Africa. <laughs> uh, depending so, on who you ask. Depending on who you ask. So it, it, it was tough. So the, 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 one of the selling points of Kia was you're using a Samsung cell phone. Uh -huh. And I said, well, it works well, doesn't it? So why would the Kia car be bad? You know, so that, uh, you, you, had to, you had to use different tactics to make it happen. And that was just part of some of the things that we would, we did. But uh, I think most importantly was to be innovative. How were we going to introduce a brand into South Africa? Hyundai had uh, just gone into liquidation and uh, a lot of people were let down by Hyundai, uh, by, the, by Billy Rotenbach. And... Uh, now here I come with uh, Kia to, to South Africa. Persona non grata. Yeah. And uh, 
the reason I had so much faith and, and belief in the brand is I had visited Korea quite a few times. And the factory that I went to produced 600,000 vehicles a month, a, a year, uh, which was is phenomenal. We don't even sell that amount of vehicles in South Africa. But I mean, even today, 50,000 cars, cars a month, that's, that's, that's a, a telephone number. But Ray, Correct. just on the Kia in the mid-1990s, you spoke about the Hyundai debacle, bringing it into Botswana in SKD form. It was no-go. There was one other one that must have been against you. Daewoo had also come to South Africa at the time in limited form and failed. So yeah, you had two Korean brands that had not done the, the country proud. What were the challenges you faced? Oh, there were so many. Give uh, us the so, top 50. So, so it wasn't about the challenges I faced. It was what could we do to move our units? And I was like an ostrich with my head in the ground. <laughs> and I uh, went forward and we thought of innovative ideas. And my daughter just qualified as a doctor. And she said to me, Dad, can I come work for you? And I said, sure. She came as my marketing manager. And uh, I had a guy that I stole from Dan Perkins in the old days, uh, Hans Stenger, to come, and write, to come and run my parts division. And when I tell you our parts department was as big as the studio, uh, really? that's, that's, how, that's how many parts we had. Um, so it, it was quite exciting. And uh, when, when I got the brand, uh, we had gearbox problems with every single Sportage that landed. No infrastructure. They, no promised, con they promised consistency and they gave you consistency. Gave you, consistency. you didn't yeah. say it was some of the, uh, all of them. All of them, without fail. And, uh, the, and the Koreans never told me that there were 200 cars on the on the water on the way to Coming South in. Africa. And uh, I never had the finance and, uh, and they, they trusted me because I'd been working with them with a brand called Asia Motors. So I had, a, I had my a toe in the water when I was importing vehicles, knew all about what had to happen. And uh, the, the challenge was to homologate vehicles for South Africa. So now when you talk about the term homologation for our audience, what exactly does that entail? Homologation means that do we meet the standards required for, for South Africa, mostly safety, uh, the biggest criteria was were the lights uh, e-marked uh, so they weren't all different directions and the glare wasn't all we over. We weren't squint, essentially. Correct. So, and yes. then we were facing all the Chinese uh, uh, cheap imports that were coming in. Uh, did the car stop in X amount of meters at certain speeds? Uh, did it have proper safety belts? Uh, was the anchorage on the safety belts uh, strong enough? And who dictated these uh, criteria? Was this the SABS at the time? So the SABS looked after that, and we did all of that at um, Gerotech. Looking to buy a new or used car? Visit changecars.co.za. All right, so Ray, you've spoken about the homologation and the troubles that you went through uh, with the Kia brand and gearboxes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But you were coming into a, a saturated market, essentially, competitive market. How did you then set yourself apart with this Kia brand of yours? Because for me, one of the things that sets it apart now, as I know it, is the warranty. So, yes, you're right. So initially, uh, all cars came with a one-year warranty or even a six-month warranty. And I've never understood Only. that. You, you've got a warranty on a brand-new car. The chance of a brand-new car giving trouble is zero, yeah. okay? But as soon as it's ready to give trouble, sorry, the warranty is expired. 100%. Um, and uh, so we thought, well, let's put a three-year warranty. So I uh, wrote to the Koreans and we studied the market and we said, Let's try a three-year warranty and put that in. Gearbox sorted out at this stage? Oh, that long. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, that, that's a story in itself. <laughs> um, we'll talk about <laughs> it one day. But um, the cars came and uh, mechanically they were perfect. Um, and uh, when you have a warranty, very, very few occasions that we really had to apply it. Amazing. Um, so that was so. So to put the brand in the market was what was innovative about our our, our brand, and uh, so I started marketing it with a three year warranty. And the other innovation that I put in, we started was cashbacks. 
You might hate me for that, but we started with it. And when you bought the Sportage, there was a 25,000 Rand cashback. Which at the time, 25,000 Rand, just on 30 years ago, was a telephone number, equivalent of 100,000 today. Huge money. So how does that work? Someone purchases a car? And we gave them a 25,000 Rand assistance. Okay. So you could either use it towards uh, covering your trade in, or you could take it back as a cash back, or you could wow. use it as your deposit. You can do what you like with it. And that's what we did with it. Now, that fund. concept, did it exist anywhere else in the world, or was that completely innovative from your side? Completely innovative from our side. I hadn't heard of it anywhere else in the world. Yeah. And where did that come from? Just wait a second. We've got a challenge. We're going to entice you to buy. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we just sat and thought about what was different. And I had quite a creative agency, uh, BNC, that used to work with me. And uh, we came up with these uh, different ideas and, and concepts. So, I needed 300,000 Rand in 1996. I bought 10 Kia, started my business. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, very, so, but very, very good. And I mean, again, I wouldn't say it's an absolute industry norm now, but it is relatively well used because it works. Mm, mm. So a, a lot of people look for, uh, have balloon payments on their cars. How do they get out of their cars? And now they get out of the cars ah. is taking the GP out of your new car and putting it towards... Uh, Paying off the balloon payment. So now when you refer to GP for our audience, you talk about the gross profit. What are dealerships working on? Anywhere between 6 and 10%, roughly around 8% on average? I would say around about 9%. No, 9%. Correct. Okay. So but you, that's gross. Of course, of course. Yeah. So if you were selling a car for a 450,000 Rand, you've got 45,000 Rand, just between 40 and 45,000 Rand. It's your ah, choice. Do I keep my 40,000 yeah, Rand yeah. profit or do yeah. I move the unit, give you 10,000, 5,000, 20,000 back? But the key in the trade. So that's where it came from. That's this 25,000 Rand that you guys were, were giving back yeah. to people. I mean, the, but the, the beautiful thing about it, they weren't inflating the prices. Our that's, margin oh, yeah. is X. I'm giving you effectively a discount. Piece of my margin. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. That's really, really nice. Very, very good. Uh, I should have bought 12. Right, I should have bought 12. You should have. And when I started the business, the rand was at four and 40 to the dollar. Yeah. And that was terrible. That was pathetic. It was weak. And it went up 10 cents or 20 cents. We'd go mad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're 18 <laughs> roughly now. Yeah. And now we're like, yeah, 18 rand 40. Uh, and uh, it's amazing how the uh, fluctuation of the of rand dollar affected pricing in, in our industry. Just an interesting <clears throat> aside about the Rand dollar. So I read an article on the internet about you in 2013. And they said, Ray, where do you see the Rand going? How close will we get back to eight or nine? He said, I promise you, it's going to go to 13 long before it goes to eight or nine. It's on the internet, 2013. I would give and anything to and, and it's now yeah, 18. Yeah. 18 now. So, uh, and then the other challenge was, how did I sell the cars? Yeah. How did I find dealers? Where was I going to find a dealer? I would go to a dealer and say, well, I don't want this rubbish. Why do I want to sell so it? When you talk about finding a dealer, you're saying, as an independent, I want to get franchises involved. Correct. Like you today have Motors, Bedvest McCarthy, the Unitrans, now known as CFAO. Is Correct. that what you're talking about? Correct. Yeah. So none of them would, none of the big guys would give me the time of day. Um, and also, none of most of the banks weren't really interested in financing here. Unknown quantity, what was the quality like? And uh, all I can say is thank God for West Bank. But in their defense, at face value, you're a bank, you've got millions and millions of rands that you are looking to extend to the public. You're doing it on a Toyota, I'm talking about at the time, on a Nissan, well-known brands. You have to repossess a car, easy to sell. In all fairness to them, were they wrong at face value? Definitely not. <laughs> um, there was no resale value on the vehicle. Of course. Or, there, there was no guaranteed there resale was value. No, at the there time. Was, but it was a very, um, it was a risky uh, in, uh, loan, uh, but, but it worked. So a big shout out to West Bank. I'm looking to bring in a car from Nigeria. Back me like you backed Ray. <laughs> <laughs> So, 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 so you were looking for a franchise operation? So we were operation? looking for dealers. So the, the strategy we adopted was to go look at used car dealers that were doing quite well. And we would say to them, uh, guys, here's a brand new car. 
put it on the side of your your business, give it a bit of branding, and uh, sell new cars. And that's how I started uh, building the dealer network for for Kia. Are you giving it to them at uh, on consignment, or are they buying it from you? No consignment. Yeah. So they they were buying it from they, you. They were paying for the cars, and they used to. Have, the, the one condition I had is they had to have a floor plan. So all the cars we sold belong to them. If you give people cars for nothing, they don't sell them. They're of course, no standard. Correct. Hundred percent. There's no motivation to sell it. So you guys talk about a floor plan. Wait, what what exactly is a floor plan? So a floor plan means a facility. So if I'm going to sell you uh, ten cars for a million rand. Mm. I need to know that I get my million rand. Okay. Okay, and that was mostly underwritten by the banks. If you took it in layman's terms, you know the term overdraft. Mm -hmm. You go to your bank and you say to them, I've got 20,000 rand in my account, I'm credit worthy, can you give me an overdraft facility for 100,000 rand? So you can effectively go Mm 80,000 overdrawn. You'd have a dealership who'd say, we've got 1 million rand cash of our own, can you give us a security, oh, okay. I mean, a loan against the security? So they'll give you a 10 million rand facility, but they technically own the cars until you sold it and settled that. Okay. Want SA's leading insurance? Visit changecars.co.za and click on the discovery logo. So we've covered quite a bit um, in this episode, Ray, talking about, you know, bringing an unknown brand into the country, the challenges that you faced over there, and essentially how you, you, you brought it up from being unknown to, you know, a brand that everyone knows and loves now. And at 68 years young, that's yourself, what advice would you give a young Michael Pursuit here, budding <laughs> businessman? You know, in terms of just being successful, what 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 does one need to do to be a successful business person? I think one needs to have a dream. And then one needs to have a roadmap. How do you make that dream come true? Whatever you do, you need a plan. Mm. And without a plan, you can't do what Michael's doing. That's interesting that you say that. And thanks for that compliment. I'm often asked the question in different formats. My advice is always see the end result before you start. I use the analogy of building a house. You have your plans. You know what the roof is going to look like before you break ground. If you don't see the end result, right? And I think that's what you did with Kia. You believed in it. Nothing was going to hold you back. You knew there was going to be challenges. Of course, the public was going to be uh, potentially put off to start off with. The dealers weren't going to buy in. Is that fair to say, see the end result? Um, it was difficult in those days to say, see the end result. I had the dream where I wanted to be, absolutely. But getting there, the roadmap was very, very rocky. Uh, and I think we will talk again in the future. But uh, the, the biggest change for Kia was the alliance with uh, Imperial. Uh, when uh, Imperial started backing Kia, um, unknown to the public, uh, when I brought the brand in, uh, the late Bill Lynch and Manita Kenya uh, assisted us in, in, in bringing in the cars. They helped with giving me a showroom and, and uh, putting the cars in bond. So uh, the uh, Imperial were the backers. What they were worried about was in 1998, uh, South Korea went insolvent. And the IMF bailed them out. And, and Ray, this- I mean, 25 years ago, I mean, when we think of South Korea, you're talking first world on a level that is beyond first world. We think of them as a stable country, which they are. 25 years ago, that was a country that was technically bankrupt. Unbelievable. And when you look at it, I think the eighth or ninth uh, most uh, influential correct, countries in correct. the world. Okay. So, now, talk, sorry to interrupt you, you're talking about Imperial. When we talk about Imperial, the brand that is Imperial, whether it be Imperial Kaya that everybody knew, if you just said Imperial, today it's Motus, an absolute monster of a company, incredible. They backed you. We are asking about advice. Whenever you start, you just need to find that one person, one entity that believes in you without Motus, Imperial at the time. Where would this brand have been, in your opinion? Uh, it would have happened, but it would have taken a little bit longer. Um, I was determined to make it happen. Um, and 
uh, I took the, the last million rand we had in our bond and I put it into the business to to make to help it grow. Literally risked it all. Yeah. And what, one of the things the Koreans did was that they gave me all the stock on consignment. That's how much trust they had in me. So that was fantastic. But I think uh, the, the alliance with Imperial, joining them on the 1st of April 1998, uh, wasn't a joke. It was... Uh, it was the right date, and uh, that made a big difference. <laughs> was uh, a joke. Was <laughs> right. You're kidding me, right? It was, no, it was no April Fool's joke, and it was it was just fantastic. And once that door was opened, that they knew that this brand was here to stay, and Imperial had dem demonstrated that they were already selling Renaults uh, that they were importing as well. So uh, they had Renaults, wow. and then just shortly after that came Daihatsu. Uh, so it, it all came together and it just started working. Now, Ray, uh, when you joined Imperial, in this is 1998, what was your position at the group? CEO of Kia. Go Good big, man. go big, <laughs> or go man. home. Yeah, literally. So the advice to the youngsters is aim for the CEO position to start or are you wasting your time? 100%. That's 100%. incredible. Correct. Ray, to say it's been a pleasure having you here, I would say is an understatement. Your knowledge... In a podcast like this, 25, 30 minutes, you can't share one fiftieth of the knowledge you've got to share and experience. Gugu, yourself, looking at a gentleman who's achieved what Ray has, how does it feel? Look, I, I feel like uh, I, I want to hear more. I, I feel like this wasn't enough. Um, so I think we need to set up something where we, we, we go in-depth in all of these stories and all of these things. I don't know about you, but that's that's just me. Ray, as I said, a privilege to have you here. Thank you, guys. Pleasure. Gents, thank you so much for your time. Ray, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here, and I want to have you back again to share your stories. Mike, really appreciate your time as well, and I appreciate you for tuning in. And if you found value in this episode, please do us a favor and subscribe to the podcast. We would love to have you as part of the family. If you're looking for a vehicle, anything Outside of an aeroplane, you'll find it on the Change Cars website. Get on there, look for your boats, your caravans, your cars, your bikes. If you need any motoring-related advice, podcast at changecars.co.za. We will do our best to answer your questions and we're affiliated with Discovery. So if you need insurance, click on the Discovery tab and get an obligation-free quote. For South Africa's best motoring content, catch all things motoring on DSTV Channel 189 and on YouTube. New episodes every week.